Well, good morning, Crossroads family. As you heard Pastor Daniel say, my name is David Guzik, and uh, I am a good friend of your pastor, and I'm so delighted that he asked me to come here this morning and to bring you something from God's Word. He also mentioned something that I have a thing called a Bible commentary. I, I shamelessly plug you my site and ask you to do something for me. The website's EnduringWord.com. You can think of that enduring word, just like when the pastor's sermon goes on forever, enduring word, dot com, and, and I've got a commentary on the entire Bible there, and some people find it helpful. This is my shameless plug. I'm asking you, and I love whenever I get a chance to stand in front of a lot of people and ask them to do this, would you please pray for the work of that commentary? You know, God is using it, and especially I'm excited that we're getting the opportunity now to have that commentary translated into other languages. Earlier this year, we put up online a complete translation of my Bible commentary in Luke into Arabic. And uh, it's an exciting thing. Look, in English, there's a lot of good Bible resources. People have to choose from. In other languages, not so much. So I just really appreciate it. If you could keep it in mind, Lord, bless Pastor David's work with Enduring Word. And Father, uh, help the work of the translation into other languages. I'd really appreciate it. And I'm especially excited that Pastor Daniel asked me to speak along with this theme that you have going on right now in the book of Proverbs. So for that, I'd like you to turn in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 4. We're going to begin at verses 11 and 12. I'm going to walk you through a few different passages in the book of Proverbs. And then we're also going to take a look at a couple of verses from Psalm 119 towards the end of my time with you here this morning. So please turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Father in heaven, I want to give you praise for being able to stand in front of these blessed people and bring a message to them from your word. Lord, would you please come and Pour out your spirit upon me as the speaker, but also pour out your spirit upon them as the listeners. Give them listening ears and me, Lord, lips to speak in a way that would bring you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. I want to talk to you this morning about your path. Here we go. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered, and when you run, you will not stumble. For the last 20 years, I've been writing a Bible commentary that's mostly published online. Most people who use it, use it online. And through those 20 years, I've always had it as this goal, I got to get through and get something on the whole Bible. I got to get through and get something on the whole Bible. It's been an obsession of mine for the last 20 years. And I saved one book to finish with the very end to complete that work. Although, look, there's a sense in which my work of doing Bible commentary, it's never going to be completed. There's always improvements. There's always revisions. There's always corrections and proofreading to be done. But there was one book that was going to be last. And the last book that I made my way to was the book of Proverbs. And I'll tell you why Proverbs was the last. Because the book of Proverbs scared me. The book of Proverbs for a Bible expositor is a challenge. It's not like any other book of the Bible. Most of Proverbs is a collection of one verse, two line sayings of wisdom. And most of those sayings of wisdoms don't really have any story, any context. And I'll be honest with you, they really don't even have great theology. The book of Proverbs certainly has some theology, speak news about how we think about God. But most of it, as you've been learning, is very practical, down-to-earth instruction 
for how we as the people of God should live in a wise way. Now, I saved the book of Proverbs for last. It took me 20 years to get to it in great depth study. But when I finally did it, I wished that I'd come to the book of Proverbs much earlier in my life. Now, please, nobody misunderstand me. I, I certainly read the book of Proverbs many times before. It's a great thing to do if you've done that pattern. I'm sure you've talked about it before. You read a chapter a day corresponding to the day of the month. You get through the book of Proverbs every month that way. That's a wonderful thing to do. And surely I have done that many times. But as far as studying it in depth, I saved it for 20 years or more. And I realized I should have done it a lot earlier. I should have studied the book of Proverbs in this kind of depth when I was a father with young children. My children are all grown now. Wonderful three children, a daughter and two sons. But listen, what I found out was that Proverbs is essentially wisdom from a parent to a child. That's the whole context of the book of Proverbs. I'll say it again. Proverbs is essentially wisdom from a parent to a child. And when that parent gives the child wisdom, we want to give it to them in a memorable way. Don't you want your children to remember certain things that you said? Don't you want it to be impressed on your children's heart? They'd say something like this. You know what? My dad said a lot of things, but what he always said to us was, but, but, but. My mom, she would always tell us this. Don't you want those things to be thought out and intentional? Don't you want it to be a word of God's wisdom? And maybe not something that you would always say in frustration or anger. Listen, we want them to remember the things we say. And it would be wonderful if, among other things, they would remember the short sayings of wisdom. To have our children say something like this. My dad always used to say, and then it laid out some wisdom from Proverbs. But wisdom that you put in your own words. Wisdom that you had lived it and thought about yourself. But how about this? Here's a few of the great themes of the book of Proverbs. How about this? My dad always used to say, wisdom is not gained by accident. That's a big theme throughout the book of Proverbs. If you want wisdom, you're not just going to fall into it. You better pursue it. Or how about this? My mom always used to say, immorality is out to get you. We need to hear that, don't we? Sometimes we think that immorality... We'll only find it because we're pursuing it. No, you need to understand that sometimes immorality is out to chase you. It's out to get you. Or how about this? My dad always used to say, laziness is a disgrace. That's a big theme throughout the book of Proverbs. But here's the one I want to speak to you about most pointedly this morning. It was connected very much with the text we read from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Here's the idea. My dad always used to say, I would love it if my kids grew up being able to say this. My dad always used to say, you are on a path and your path has a direction and a destination. Brothers and sisters, that's what I'm here to talk to you about this morning. The idea of a path is repeated again and again in the book of Proverbs. And it's in our central text. Let me read that to you again. Look at it one more time. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Let's look at those words. It says this. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. Again, this is the book of Proverbs. This is a father speaking to his children. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I've led you in the right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. You see, we sense that Solomon received an appropriate satisfaction in doing his duty to teach his children wisdom, even as his father David taught him. So he wanted to guide his children into the future. He wanted them to have a successful future. Look at that phrase in verse 12. When you run, you will not stumble. Isn't that what we all want for our kids? We don't want them to stumble through life. We want them to be set free to run the course that God has them and run in freedom and run in skill and run in speed and not stumble and trip and fall. And brothers and sisters, this is so important for us because we as parents, we often work hard to prepare our children to succeed in this world. We want them to run well. So what do we do? Man, we put them in the best school that we can. 
We, we drill them with the homework. We get them with the discipline. We do everything we can to really raise the kids so that they can run well. And all of that may be fine and good. But, but if you're not giving attention to their moral guidance, if you're not giving attention to who they are as spiritual sons and daughters of God, it's a very incomplete work that you're doing. We want them to run, to not stumble, to not be hindered. We want to be able to say, look at the phrase in verse 11. I have led you in right paths. Now, why are those ways called a path? Because they're ancient and proven ways. A path is simply a place where people have gone before. That's what makes it a path. You could walk through a field of grass that has no path. And if you're the first one to walk there, you're just walking through a field of grass. But if it's a path that other people have gone before, there's a way to mark. And that's what he wants to do, to lead them into right paths that we can follow. So do you get the idea? Brothers, sisters, you are on a path, and that path has a destination. Now, when I was praying over this message, when I was considering what I would bring to you, the Crossroads family, I was a little bit nervous. And I'll tell you what was making me nervous. I was thinking, David, this message is so simple. It's so elementary. That might work for like a superficial California audience. These people are Vancouverans. They're Portlandians. These people are smart. They're sophisticated. They actually read books. They actually think. You can't bring them something that simple. But no, brothers and sisters, isn't there something very profound in just thinking about these very simple principles from God's word and applying them to our life? And this is what we have to consider. you got to consider, look at the path that you are on. The path that you're on has a position. You are at a certain position on the path that you're on. As you make your way along that path, there's a progress along the way, and there's going to be a product at the end of that path. Think of it, the path, the position, the progress, the product. And we need to look at our path in those ways. You see, people have a way of looking at their life right now. And this is what they're saying. They say, right now, I'm not doing too bad. Everything must be okay. But they are really just at an early point on a terrible path. Now's the time for you to see and judge and change your ways before your path progresses to its ultimate destination. And it's a place that you or I do not want to be. You need to think about it, where you've been, where you are, and where you're going. You may be doing fine today. And if you are, praise the Lord. But listen, how does this play out? How does the direction of your life play out in another year? In another three years, in another five years, you're on a path. You were somewhere, you're somewhere now, and you're directed somewhere. So how can we evaluate our present point and progress? We need to look around with where we're at and get our bearings. You may wish to just freeze yourself in time at your present point. But listen, that's not how a path works. You see, the thought you indulge in right now, it's going to become a practice in five years. The sin that you dabble in today, it's going to be a hardened habit in another three years. What you indulge in today may be in just a few years an addiction in your life. Friends, it's a very simple but a very powerful principle. You are on a path and that path has a direction and a destination. And apply, it applies across the board in your life. Right now, let, let me just call out some areas. Financially, you're on a path, aren't you? Maybe today, you got enough to pay the bills. But you look at where you've been. You look at where you're going. Trouble. Do you see right now, God's giving you the wisdom. Say, I'm on a path. I need to pay attention to that. Physically, you're on a path spiritually you are on a path and this is what I want to speak to most directly you need to evaluate where you've been where you are and where you're going and act in wisdom 
And brothers and sisters, this idea is repeated many, many times in the book of Proverbs. Let me just read to you a few examples. I'll do the best I can to not give much comment on these verses because they pretty much speak to themselves. But let me just read you some other passages from the book of Proverbs. You can follow along. First of all, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Look at this. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Do you see that? There's a bad path. Stay off the bad path. The bad path will have bad associates on it. Maybe that's one way that you can tell that you're on a bad path. Look at the people traveling the same path with you. Here's another one. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 20. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? God wants you to walk in the way of goodness. And there's a path of righteousness that he has for your life. And I know the devil whispers to each one of us, you don't want to walk the way of righteousness. That's boring. Listen, that's a lie from the enemy. Because when you look at the destination of the other path, you go, no, this is the right path. The good one. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 23. Then you will walk safely in your way, and your foot will not stumble. This is what we want. We want a path that's safe, secure, that we won't stumble from. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter into the perfect day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. There's paths you can walk. One is filled with light and illumination. The other one is filled with darkness. Brothers and sisters, this is such a dominant theme throughout the whole book of Proverbs that it really struck me. This is the kind of wisdom that I wish I had established my own catchphrase for it, my my own way of describing it. I I wish I would have put it into my children when they're young. Maybe now I got the chance to do it with them as they're adults. And in my grandchildren, I can put it in them. But listen, we need to remember, these are the big themes of Proverbs, and we need to take them to heart. I'm going to share with you one more verse from Proverbs. And this one, man. It's a heavy one. You ready for a heavy one? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Let me tell you something about Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. This verse is so heavy and so important that it's repeated three times in the book of Proverbs. Once other in Proverbs, it's repeated exactly. And another place, it's repeated in paraphrase. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Buckle your seatbelts for this one. Ready? There is a way that seems right to a man or to a woman. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs often speaks of this way, this path that a man or a woman walks upon. And there's a way that you can walk that can seem right to a man or a woman. You think everything's fine. It seems okay to me. But its end is the way of death. Now some people walk a path of life that they know is wrong. Creation, conscience, whatever, it tells them you're on the wrong path. And look, let's face it, in our own rebelliousness, sometimes we're just, I don't care that I'm on our path. It's fun. I'm going for it. This is the way I'm going. Sometimes we know we're on the wrong path, but we just want to be on the wrong path. Isn't that true? Brothers and sisters, there's other times where we think we're on the right path. It feels right to us, but the end of that path is the way of death. Here's the lesson. It isn't enough to feel good about our path. It isn't enough to follow our heart on life's way. God's word gives us the pathway. I mean, look, it's a scary thought. If I can't trust my heart... If I can't say, all right, if it feels good to me, if it seems good to me, then it must be the right path. Then how am I ever going to know what the right way is? If only God had given us a book that spelled it out for us. Well, he did, didn't he? This is why we take the Bible seriously. 
this is why we let the Bible be the authority in our life. Because when we let the Bible be the authority in life, we're really letting Jesus be the authority in our life, are we not? When we let Jesus be the authority in our life through his word, what we're saying is it's not enough that it seems right to me. It has to be right according to what Jesus says. Because Jesus knows me. Jesus knows life. He knows it all even better than I think I do. Friends, the path that feels right isn't always right. And that's why we must come and run to what God says. This makes very plain our need for a word from God. We cannot entirely trust our own self-examination, our own judgment. It would be something like this. You say, um, well, you know, I went to the doctor and I just told him, doctor, I feel fine. The doctor says, well, then what need are there? Further tests. You feel fine, go home. But you and I know that there are many medical problems that a person may have where they are not able to detect until it's almost at ruin for them. And there are times when you have to believe the doctor when he says there's a problem, even when you don't feel like there's a problem. That's what the Bible does for us. That's what Jesus does for us in his word. And the principle of this proverb is so important that God repeats it again twice more. But in all of this, one principle is very clear. You are on a path in your personal life, in your spiritual life, in your emotional life, in your physical life, in your financial life, in your habits of holiness. You're on a path. Now think about it. What were the habits of holiness in your life a year ago or two years ago? What are they now? Where are they headed? That's a path. That's a direction. Consider the path you're on. You're on a path in your romantic life, in your married life, in your family life. You're on a path in your service to God, your service to his people, your service to a needy world. In each of those, there's a destination to the path you're on. I'm just giving you a call. Hopefully, the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart right now, saying, look at the path that I'm on. Now, there's several helpful applications of this principle. And again, some of them are so simple. I almost apologize to giving them to an audience such as you. But let me say it. I'll just say it very plainly again. Number one, not every path has a good direction and destination. So think about the path that you're on. Number two, you have a real choice regarding your path. You have a real choice regarding your point, your progress, the product of your path. If you had no choice regarding any of those things, why would God even speak to them? Why would God even speak to you about it here in the book of Proverbs? But the glorious truth is that as men and women created in the image of God, God speaks to you as intelligent beings made in his image. And he says, look, brother, sister, think about the path that you're on. You can make a choice about your path today. And then you have to ask some relevant questions. In these different areas of my life, what path am I on? What point am I on on that path? What progress am I? Am I moving along the path on a snail's pace? Or am I moving with with rapid progress? What is the destination of the path that I'm headed on? And again, most pointedly, I can just make this application. Think of the direction, the course of your life. Where's it going to be in three years? Where's it going to be in five years? Seven years? You may be doing fine today, but have you thought about the path that you're on? And I'll assure you of this. The devil does not want you to think about such questions. It is the devil's earnest desire that you live an unexamined life. I love what C.S. Lewis said in the Screwtape Letters. He gave us the thought that many times we think that that, uh, Satan and his agents are trying to put ideas into our head. Where oftentimes their most effective work is by keeping ideas from our head. And if there's any idea that the devil would love to keep from your head here, it's the fact that you're on a path. And the path has a progress. 
And the path has a product to it. I told you at the beginning of the message that I wanted to point to a couple verses in Psalm 119. So if you would turn to the left in your Bible, probably all not all that far, Psalm 119, I want you to take a look at verses 59 and 60. It feels strange to mention verses that high in a biblical chapter, but Psalm 119 has 176 verses. It's a marvelous psalm, all focused on the greatness and the glory of God's word. But there are two very special verses, at least to my heart, in Psalm 119, among many others, verses 59 and 60. Think about this in reference to the idea of the way in Proverbs. Ready for this? Psalm 119, verses 59 and 60. I thought about my ways. I turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. As the psalmist spent time in God's word, it gave him reflection about his ways. And he understood that as he thought about his ways, he turned his feet towards God's testimony, God, towards God's word. Now, one of the reasons why those two verses are so special to me is because they were so special to a great French philosopher named Blaise Pascal. Pascal's a very famous man in the history of philosophy. And Blaise Pascal was a Bible-believing Christian. And he believed the Bible so much that he used to memorize passages of the Bible. And one of the passages he memorized, because he loved it so much, was he memorized Psalm 119. Can you imagine that? All 176 verses, he memorized Psalm 119. But verses 59 and 60 were two of his most favorite verses from that psalm. You see, he called those verses the turning point of man's character and destiny. He meant that it's vital for every man and woman to consider his or her ways and to understand that if our ways are destructive, that they're going to lead us to destruction and we need to make an about face and go in God's ways instead. And so this is what God calls us to do. Look at those words from Psalm 119 again, verse 59. I thought about my ways. Brother, sister, would you please think about your ways? And I turn my feet to your testimonies. If you need to turn your feet in a particular way, you need to change your direction, do it now. But then look at verse 60. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. You see, once we're on the right path, get moving on it. Don't make delay, but make haste. He says there, and I love that phrase, I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. Listen, it's dangerous to run fast on the wrong path. But once you're on the right path, come on now, get going. Why are you moving first like a snail on the right path? Many of us, when we were on the wrong path, we ran it hard. Man, we gave it all the energy we could. And somehow, some way, we get put on the right path, and what do we do? Man, it's like we're moving along with walkers or something. No, no, never. No, now that we're on the right path, we should have the heart that says, I made haste, and I did not delay to keep your commandments. So brothers, sisters, here's the very plain and simple call of God to us right here, right now. You're on a path. That path has a direction. It has a destination. What are you going to do with that path? Let me end with two important verses. One I've read to you already. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is the way of death. You think it's an accident that you're here on this particular morning? Do you think it's an accident that God is speak to you about something so plain, so basic, so fundamental? 
Do you think it's an accident that you're here to examine something that God's been speaking to your life, maybe in, in a dozen small ways throughout the week, but right here, right now, he's speaking to you in a special way, saying, you're right. I need to get this straight with the kind of path that I'm on. But then there's another verse I need to give to you. And this one is the last verse. And in some ways, I've saved the most important verse for last. Are you ready for this most important verse? To many of you, you're going to be familiar with this verse, but you're going to see how it connects with everything I've been speaking to you about. It's the words of Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now Jesus spoke many precious words, but as I think of that great theme of the book of Proverbs, that we're on a path and we need to give heed to that path, when I think of the fact that Jesus said very boldly to his disciples and to the whole world, Jesus said, I am the way. No mere man could ever say that. No prophet could say that. Isaiah could never say it. Daniel could never say it. John the Baptist could never say it. The great prophets of old, they always pointed to God and his Messiah. But Jesus himself could say, I'm not pointing you to a way. What did he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. When I'm calling you to examine your path, what I'm really calling you to do is examine your relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the way. This is not fundamentally a call to turn over a new leaf, to try harder, to, to make resolutions, though some of that may have their place and God may use it to some degree, but fundamentally it's pointing you to Jesus Christ who is the way. And once you surrender your life to Jesus, you need to have that heart of Psalm 119, verses 59 and 60, where you say, I made haste and I did not delay. Jesus, now I'm on the right path with you. I want to progress along it as hard and as fast as I can. This is my heart. This is my hope. Each one of us inevitably come to a place where our path will end. One way or another, we will pass from this life to the next. It is never too early for you to change the path you're on. And it is never too late for you to change that path that you're on. Give attention to it. Ask God to speak to you. Come to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And when you come to him, make haste and do not delay on that right path. Let me pray right now. Father in heaven.